Mrs. Gayton and her husband were walking to her cousin's house near the British Museum in London. Mr. Gayton looked worried. What's the matter? Mrs. Gayton asked him. Is something wrong at work? Mr. Gayton published books and papers about history. I had another angry letter this morning. He replied. The same man keeps writing to me. Who is he? Asked Mrs. Gayton. He's a very rich man from Warwickshire called Mr. Carswell. Answered her husband. My cousin and his wife have a second house in Warwickshire. Maybe they know him. She said. I don't think that they will know Carswell. He's not a nice man. He said. What have you done to make him angry? She asked. He has written a paper about the history of black magic, and he sent it to me to publish. I sent it to Edward Dunning to review, because he's the best person in England on this subject. He thought that it was very bad, and that I should not publish it. I wrote to Mr. Carswell to tell him, but of course I didn't give him Dunning's name. Mr. Carswell is very angry about it. He keeps trying to ask me about the review and the name of the person, but I'll never tell him. Yes, it may be very bad for Edward if Mr. Carswell learn his name. Agreed Mrs. Gayton. Edward Dunning was a good friend of the Gaytons and Mrs. Gayton was worried for him. She decided to speak to her cousin about Carswell at lunch. Yes, I have heard of him. Her cousin told her. And I even saw him this morning. He was coming out of the British Museum. Do you know him? What is he like? Asked Mrs. Gayton. He's a horrible man. He is rude, angry, and never kind. About ten years ago, he wrote a book called The Mystery of Magic. My friend, John Harrington, gave it a bad review. He said, Didn't John Harrington have a horrible accident? Said Mrs. Gayton. Yes. He fell out of a tree and broke his neck. It was terrible. He was walking down a country road on his own late at night. He suddenly became very frightened and climbed up the tree. So what happened to him? Why did he do that? His brother, Henry, has never been able to understand it. At home, Mrs. Gayton said to her husband, I hope that you can keep Edward Dunning's name a secret from that horrible man, Carswell. I won't tell Carswell, of course, said Mr. Gayton. But he might ask questions at the British Museum Library. And if I tell the librarians not to speak about Dunning, I will have to explain more. Let's just hope that Carswell won't ask them. But Carswell was a clever man. A few days later, Edward Dunning was traveling home on the bus from the British Museum Library. He was a historian, and he studied in the library nearly every day. It was too dark to read his book, so he looked at the advertisements on the window opposite him. Suddenly, he saw a new one with blue letters. John Harrington died on the 18th of September 1909. He had three months. Dunning thought that this was very strange, so he wrote down the words. When he got off the bus, he asked the driver about it, but the driver knew nothing. The next morning, Dunning got on the same bus and looked for the advertisement, but it was not there. That evening, another strange thing happened. Dunning was walking down a quiet street near his house. A man on the corner was holding some paper advertisement, but nobody took one. When Dunning passed him, the man put an advertisement into his hand and Dunning felt a little shock. 
He looked down at the paper in his hand and saw the name Harrington again in large blue letters. The next minute, another man hurried past him and took the paper out of his hand. Dunning quickly looked all around him, but the man was gone. The next day, Dunning was back at his desk in the British Library, but he was feeling worried and found it difficult to work. He could not stop thinking about the name John Harrington in blue letters. Two strange things have happened to me this week. He thought. What does it mean? Suddenly, he thought that someone behind him was saying his name. He turned around quickly and some of his books and papers fell on the floor. But there was nobody there. Dunning put his things back on his desk and then saw a man near him. He was holding out a book. May I give you this? Said the man. I think that it is yours. Yes, it is mine. Replied Dunning. Thank you. But the man was already walking away. Dunning went to speak to the librarian. Who is that man? He asked her. He's a man called Carswell. The librarian replied. A few days ago, he asked me for the name of the most important historian in England on the subject of magic. Of course, I gave him your name. Shall I run after him? No! cried Dunning. Please don't! I want to keep away from him. All right, said the librarian. He doesn't come here very often, so I don't think that you'll meet him. Dunning usually enjoyed his evenings at home on his own, but this evening he felt nervous about going back to his quiet house. When he got at his door, he was very surprised to see the doctor coming out. I'm very sorry to say that both your servants are seriously ill. The doctor told him. I have sent them to the hospital. I think that they have eaten something dangerous. How could that happen? Asked Dunning, feeling more worried than ever. A man came to the house at lunchtime selling fish and they bought some. Maybe the fish made them ill, replied the doctor. But the strange thing is that this man did not sell fish to any other houses in the street today. Your servants will be in hospital for a few days, so why don't you come and have dinner with me tonight? Dunning was very happy to agree and he did not go back to his empty house until 11.30 p.m. He went straight to bed and lay in the dark, trying to sleep. Suddenly, he heard a door open downstairs, and he jumped out of bed. He hurried out to the corridor and listened at the top of the stairs. But everything was quiet, and he could see no lights downstairs. He went back into his bedroom, turned the key in the door, and got back into bed. He lay down, put his hand under the pillow, and got the most horrible shock. His fingers touched a mouth, with teeth, and hair around it. He was sure that it was not the mouth of a person. Dunning was terrified. In just a few seconds, he was out of bed, out of his room, and safely inside another room. There he passed a terrible night, listening for noises and feeling very frightened. Early the next morning, he went nervously back to his bedroom. He looked under the pillow, but there was nothing there. Everything looked normal, but he still felt very afraid. What am I going to do today? He thought. I don't want to go to the British Museum Library because Carswell might be there. But I don't want to stay in this empty house. So, first... He went to the hospital to visit his servants, and then he went to eat lunch in a restaurant. He was happy to see two friends there, but Mr. and Mrs. Gayton got a shock to see Dunning's white and worried face. He told them about the horrible things that happened at his house the day before. You mustn't go home to an empty house, said Mrs. Gayton. Come and stay with us. That evening, Dunning told them about Carswell. 
He was at the British Museum Library yesterday. I think that he know that I read his book. I don't think that the man is dangerous. Everything will be all right if you keep away from him," said Mr. Gayton. But Mrs. Gayton saw that Dunning still looked very frightened. "What's the matter?" she asked. "What are you worried about?" "Do you know anything about a man called John Harrington?" Dunning replied. Mrs. Gayton was shocked. "Yes." "Why?" Then Dunning told them about the advertisement on the bus and the paper in the street, both with John Harrington's name on. I only know that he died suddenly ten years ago. Mrs. Gayton said, she did not want to tell Dunning about John Harrington's terrible accident and make him even more worried. But John had a brother called Henry. She said. He might know more. If you'd like to meet him, I'll ask my cousin for Henry Harrington's address. Dunning agreed, and a few days later, he and Henry Harrington met. Dunning told him about the two advertisement with John's name on, and about his servants and his frightening night at home. Then Henry Harrington told Dunning about the mystery of his brother's accident. My brother was acting very strangely for a few weeks before he died. Harrington said, "He thought that someone was following him, and he talked to me about black magic. I don't know if I believe in that, but I also felt that someone wanted to hurt him. Maybe someone is trying to hurt you too. Can you think of anyone?" "Yes, I think that I can." Said Dunning, "I gave a writer a bad review, and I believe that he is angry with me." My brother did the same thing. Is that person called Carswell? Asked Harrington. "Yes, he is." Dunning was very shocked to hear that it was the same man. Then I must tell you more about my brother," said Harrington. John loved music and often went to listen to it. Once he was at a concert and he lost his program, so the man next to him gave him his program to keep. That night, my brother felt very nervous, but he did not understand it. I visited him the next day, and we sat together by the fire, talking about the concert. When he opened the program to show me, he found a small piece of paper inside. The paper had some very strange writing on it, and John thought that it might be important. So he decided to look for the man at the next concert and give the program back to him. But suddenly the piece of paper blew into the fire. You can't give it back to the man now. I told John, and he was angry with me. Why do you keep saying that? He asked me. But I didn't understand him because I only said it once. I was worried that my brother was going crazy. After John died, I read Carswell's book about black magic, and I was very shocked. The writing was very bad, but the subject was also frightening. One chapter was about putting a curse on someone, and Carswell knows his subject very well. I think that the writing on the paper was a curse. Carswell wanted my brother to die. Maybe John died because he couldn't give the paper back to Carswell. But if you can give the paper back, maybe you can break the curse. Then Dunning told Harrington about his last visit to the British Museum Library. Carswell was there. Some of my books fell on the floor, and he gave one back to me. He said, "We must go to your house and check that book now." Said Henry, "There may be something inside it." They hurried together to Dunning's house, and he got out the book.
When Denning opened it, a very thin, light piece of paper fell out and blew towards the open window. Harrington ran to the window and quickly closed it. The two men looked at the paper and saw that it had strange writing on it, too. This is just like my brother's paper. You must give it back to Carswell and only you can do it. But Carswell must not know that it's you, so you'll need to look different. You must cut off your beard and wear different clothes. Dunning looked very frightened. But how long have I got before? My brother got the paper on the 18th of June, and he died three months later. Harrington said. Dunning remembered the advertisement on the bus. It said he had three months. He looked at Harrington. I saw Carswell at the library a week ago, on the 23rd of April. He said. Does that mean that, that I'm going to die on the 23rd of July? I'll help you to give the paper back. Harrington told him. I'll watch Carswell and tell you when you can do it safely. For the next few weeks, Dunning waited nervously for news about Carswell. Then, just a week before July 23rd, Dunning got a message from Harrington. It said, Carswell is going to France. He is getting the train from London to Dover on Thursday, the 21st of July at 9 p.m. I will follow him onto the train. You must get on the train at the last stop. Look for me on the train, but don't speak to me. And remember the paper. Thursday came and Dunning was ready. His beard was gone and he wore a new hat and coat. He waited nervously for the train at Croydon, the last stop before Dover. If I can't give the paper back to Carswell, I will die. He kept thinking. The train came into the station and Dunning could see Harrington at the window. He got onto the train and sat down near Carswell, without looking at Harrington. On the seat next to him, opposite Carswell, was Carswell's coat. But Dunning could not put the paper into the coat. To break the curse... He had to give it to Carswell, and Carswell had to take it from him. Carswell looked nervous and got up from his seat to stand at a window. While he was there, Dunning looked at the man's back. Maybe he could take it without Carswell seeing, put the paper into the bag and give the bag back to him. Or was that too dangerous? Carswell might be watching. Carswell came back to his seat, but he did not sit down for long. He stood up again, and when he did that, something fell quietly off his seat. It was the envelope with his tickets in. Dunning waited until Carswell turned away, then quickly took the envelope from the floor and put the paper inside. The next minute Carswell was back again. May I give you this? I think that it is yours. Dunning said to him, holding out the envelope. Carswell looked at the envelope. Yes, it is. Thank you. He said, and he quickly put it in his jacket. For the last few minutes of the journey, Dunning felt terrified. Carswell might look in the envelope and see the paper. When the train stopped at Dover, Carswell took his coat off the seat and stood up. Dunning and Harrington followed him off the train without speaking. Then Carswell walked towards the boat to France and Harrington walked behind him. He watched Carswell show his ticket to the man and walk onto the boat. But the ticket man shouted after Carswell. Your friend didn't show me his ticket. What do you mean? Replied Carswell angrily, looking round. I'm sorry. Said the man. I thought there was someone with you. But it was just your coat. Then Carswell was gone. When Harrington told him about this, Dunning was still worried. Is something frightening following Carswell now because of the curse? And did it follow your brother years ago? 
Did I do the right thing? Is Carswell going to die? He asked. Maybe we should send him a message. I don't think that we should, replied Harrington. He is a murderer. But if you want to send him a message, then I won't stop you. I saw in his suitcase that he's traveling to Abbeville in France. I'll send a message to all the hotels in Abbeville. My message will say, look in your envelope. Then I will feel happier. Said Dunning. Dunning sent the message. But did Carswell get it and D.D. he understand it? Nobody will ever know.